Another bread and butter trick in virtually every game ever made is the breakable. Now, the thing that defines a breakable is that it interacts with something, it changes state, and then generates some extra content. Now, good examples are the crate. You hit a crate, that's the interaction with the player. Changes state, which means it uh, it, it shatters or it, it swaps out another object and plays a bunch of uh, motion usually. And it generates extra content, which is probably a particle effect of the explosion or dust or splinters. And usually some loot that you can pick up. This could be a gem in a match three game where you click on the gem and it pulses. It does a big pop kind of a swoop thing. It generates a bunch of particles, swoopy, neat sparkles, and a sound effect, and then spawns some new content in that maybe other gems will drop or things around it will move. New stuff comes in from the top, or you get points or rewards or something out of it. Uh, like even a character can be a breakable. If you have an alien with a laser gun, you interact with the player input of shooting it, the laser object interacts with the alien, hits it. The alien uh, changes its state by playing a dying animation, probably you know ragdolling or turning into a static object that can leave behind, and it generates extra content in the form of you know damage effects, blood particles, maybe some loot, maybe some ammo or whatever. You get the idea. In the case of the gem, it's not really breakable, but it follows the same pattern. And you'll hear people talk about breakables, and that is what they mean. So let's set one up right now and see how you do that in Playmaker. For this example, I've got a simple 3D scene. I've put a plane on the ground at 000, 000 and scaled it up pretty large. And I've got a first-person controller in here, so we can walk into a trigger to activate what we want to have happen to the breakable, just like we did in the last example. Now I've authored a couple little 3D objects. Here's a vase, and let me throw my color sheet onto that. So you can see what it looks like right away. Simple little vase I've made. This is just a thing you might find in a game somewhere and you'd run up and shatter it and then out would come like uh, some coins or some loot that you might find. Uh, you hope. Sometimes they're empty. And I've also created a broken vase object. And this one, I created it in exactly the same file. Both of these were made at the same time. I actually copied the vase and made this broken vase. And it's just the leave behind. So after the vase breaks, this is all you're going to see is this little chunk. So these two things line up exactly. As you can see they've both been authored so that the rotation point on them is exactly at the bottom of it so I can line it up very precisely. And they both match. And this is really important because if you don't match these, if these are a little off, you know, you, it'll look like your object jumps when it breaks. And unless that's really what you want to have happen, it's going to look pretty, pretty weird. So we're going to need a trigger around these to set them off. So let's go ahead and make another big cube in Unity, and I'll line that up at 0, 0, 0. Let's scale it up to 3 by 3 by 3. That's probably a lot taller than we need. I'm going to pull it up. I numerically set that to 1.5. Put half its height. Its origin point is in the middle, so if we go up half its actual height. That puts it exactly square on the ground. And I will once again get rid of the mesh renderer, remove component, and click on is trigger under box collider. And that has created a nice big trigger. And what we're going to do is use our first person controller capsule here. When it enters into the trigger, like so, then we'll trigger the breakable event. In, a, in your game, you'll probably want to do this with uh, some kind of force applied uh, tied into physics or a a swing hit from your character or a shot or something like that. But I'm just showing how the breakable works right now. And so we're going to use a trigger that is easy to walk into and see what's going on. And before we move on, let me once again name this because you can end up with a lot of cubes halfway through your project and you will be totally baffled as to what's going on. Call it breakable trigger. And there we go.
I'll add my FSM right to the trigger itself, and we'll use it to take action on these other objects. So make sure you've got your triggerable, triggerable, your trigger selected. Right click in the Playmaker window, add new FSM. And I'm going to call this first state normal. You could also, actually, this is more, let's call it unbroken. That seems to make a little more sense. And I'm going to need another state for exploding and one third state for broken. What these states represent is unbroken will be when the first the, the vase itself is showing and that's all. Nothing's been broken, nobody's ever touched it. It's it's fine, normal, nothing's happened. Exploding will be the state during the short time that the thing is exploding, particles are playing, sounds are playing, any of that. Just like on our chest, we had to have a state for when the lid was opening, when it was closing, it needed a little bit of time to take care of that. That's what this exploding state is going to be. And the broken state will be where we leave the vase at the end of our example. So that'll be just this little leave behind chunk that we talked about and uh, probably no further action will be available on this at all. So this will just be a terminating state. None of these will feed back into each other. So let's add transition to these first two. And remember, we don't need one here because once we're broken, we're broken. You can't hit it again to make it fixed. Maybe you can if you've got some kind of cool magic in your game that's restorative, but my example does not have restorative magic. So. We're going to wire these together. I just want to show you, you can actually hook stuff up even before you have events in there. Let me pick a couple events now. Make these, let's say, break for the first one. And this one, actually, we can just go ahead and use finished because that's all we're going to do is wait for everything to be finished. Hey, looking pretty good so far. Now, the next step, of course, would be we need to hide this little tiny piece here, this vase broken, when we don't want to see it yet when the thing first starts up. The key to this trick is having the objects swap visibility during the explosion. So we're going to start out with the vase being visible and the vase broken not being visible. And then when the, that's the unbroken state. And then when we explode, we're going to make the vase itself invisible. And we're going to make the leave behind here, the vase broken, become visible. And that's just going to be a fast pop. One will come on, one will come off. And we'll hide that with a particle effect. So let's set up the visibility swap right now. So to start with, we've got the unbroken state here, and it's got the trigger on it listening. And that's not really where we want to set up the visibility. So I'm going to make a new state. I'm going to call this setup. And inside of that, I'll add a new action. Let me just type in visibility. And I'll choose set visibility. And we are going to specify a game object, in this case, the vase broken. Here's an interesting point. I've got the vase broken, which is the object itself, and the vase broken below it, which is the visible object. It's got the mesh renderer, and it has the color sheet texture I added. This is the thing that has visibility, visible qualities to it. So this is the part we need to hide, not the entire object. So once again, I'll come to setup, and I'm going to choose this part drag it right on there. So the vase broken object. And visible is off by default and that is exactly what we want. And I want to turn off reset on exit or else it's going to undo what we've set when we leave. And I'm going to right click on this and tell it to set as start state. And that will make this the first thing that happens. And on finishing all of that, I'm going to flow right out into this unbroken state. There you can see that I set this up 
it's just going to start up with this object, set the invisibility really quickly, and flow right into Unbroken. You can think of this if you've ever scripted as your early setup stuff that you do. This is a way to take care of things when your object comes into being and never come back to these again. Just do it once. So here we have our trigger event still going on. And the next visibility swap will be when the explosion happens. So we assume the break event has happened. Uh, somebody has hit this with a stick or kicked it or an explosion has gone off. And that is when we want to see this disappear and this thing appear. So let's come back over here. So if I come to this setup state and choose right here on the set visibility, if I choose the settings drop down and copy selected actions and come back into exploding, right click, paste actions, and there you get a set visibility. And I'm going to do it again because I want two of these. So to start, now they've carried over the vase broken object, right? and I'm going to make this visible. But the next one still has the vase broken. I'm going to drag the vase object into it instead. And visibility is off by default, and that's exactly what we want. So let's play and see what we get. Okay, there's the vase. And you notice right away, we went from setup into the unbroken state, which is what we wanted. And you cannot see the broken vase little bottom leaf behind there. So let's move into the trigger, and pop, one disappears, and the other one appears. And that looks cheesy now, but that is exactly what we want to have happen. The last thing to add here would be a trigger event, so that when we enter the trigger, we're gonna set off the break. So let's go to the action browser, Choose trigger event, and we're going to choose, oh, my mistake, we're going to choose on trigger enter, and we're going to send the event break, and that will send this event into exploding. Let's test that really quick to make sure everything we've wired up so far is good. So we move into the trigger, and it moves us through those states. So looking good. The last little bit of our breakable here will be the particle emitter that hides this transition that happens when we go into the exploding state. I have a cheesy little prefab break puff that I made earlier. Poof. And you can see it go off there. It's nothing special, but it represents a, a simple little puff that would happen like when your stick or when your explosion happens you're going to get a poo kind of a break thing and that will hide this transition to a larger or or smaller degree so let's go ahead and wire that in and i'll show you how it works in our exploding state we want to add this break puff i'm going to get it out of the scene for right now we want to add this break puff spawn it in when this happens and I want it to happen before the visibility swaps because I want this to go on kind of behind the smoke and mirrors while the, the particle effect is playing. So uh, with this selected, you can choose the action browser and it will insert the new action above the selected action, which is really cool. So I'm going to pick that and I want to create an object and the object is that prefab with the particle effect in it. I'll choose Create Object. Oh, and it didn't work for me, sorry. Well, let me show you a second thing where you can right-click and move action to the top, which is very cool. So, all right, there, two for one. Uh, now, I need to specify the game object. In this case, it is this particle break puff that I've got. I'm gonna drop it right in there. And the spawn point we need to talk about because it needs to know where do I want to create this object. And I want to create it, remember I talked about having the vase and the broken vase created at exactly the same location, right here. I made them so that they're centered and they're placed exactly on the ground. And I want my particle effect to come in at the same spot because that's I've authored it to line up with this. 
So right here in the spawn point, I can actually just choose the vase that I want you to be where that is. And Playmaker's going to take care of all the little weird stuff about finding the location and dealing with all that for you. You can also put in a, a position manually. In this case, I want it to line up with the objects I already have. And then the visibilities are going to happen right there. So let's play this and see what it looks like so far. So there's our vase. We come forward. We set this off. Poof. And we had a little explosion. And there it went. Now, that is exactly how we want it to work. And of course, the particle effect is, you know, it's not all that much. I just threw it together so I could show you how this works. If you were making this uh, for a releasing game, you'd probably want, you know, chunks that flew off of the, off the thing. And, and you might actually even animate the, uh, this breakable actually falling apart a little bit and, you know, some pieces falling onto the ground. Maybe you'd even spawn in some chunks that you left behind so it had a cooler look. All of that just happens right here in the exploding state, right? And then everything that's left behind, this state is, is dead. Nothing happens in it. We're done, and it's gone, and this is all there is. Okay, so all that's left is to turn this into a prefab that we can use over and over and over again. So my prefabs folder, I'm going to create a new prefab, and I'm going to call it um, Vase Breakable. And then I will take um, all of this stuff, and I'm going to parent the breakable to the vase. It, asks, it says, are you sure you want to do that? Yes, I absolutely do. So I've parented all this stuff to my vase. And a uh, quick test here before I make a prefab out of it, make sure it's still working. Yep, everything worked good. And then I'm going to take that and drop it on my vase breakable. And you'll see that now inside of that, I've got the vase, the vase broken, and the trigger. And you can edit the FSM of this trigger right here inside the, uh, the prefab, which is really cool. Now I can get rid of that in my scene and instead bring in the vase breakable. And let's just, uh, let's duplicate that a couple of times. Move like uh, three of them in here so we can see them. And I'll play this scene. Go back and there I've got my three. And they should all function independently now because remember we wired them up so that they would each do what they do all by themselves. And there it is. We've got three little breakables you can place anywhere you want all around the game and they're all going to function independently. Pretty cool. So when this vase breaks, we want to have some kind of thing come out of it like a reward. So let's wire up a quick little coin object uh, as kind of a spawnable treasure. I'm going to get rid of that for now. And I have a little coin object I've made. And it is a little thing. Let me put the color sheet on it so you can see that it's a gold coin. It's an amazing. And I've got it at 000. And you'll notice that I've authored it to be up off the ground a little bit. Right? The center point for this object is located exactly on the ground. This is world 000. But the coin itself is up in the air. And Again, that is so I can line it up with all of the other objects, like this vase. If I go back and bring in that vase breakable again, they line up exactly in the same spot. And that's what we want. So, with our coin object, we want it to rotate. And it can rotate all the time. So let's make a quick little FSM. I'm going to add this. You notice I added it to the geometry like we talked about last time. This is the visible part of the object, and that is the part I want to rotate. And I'll just call this rotate because that's all it's going to do. Add an action. Type in rotate. And if I go down to rotate here under transform, what I'm looking for. And we can use owner that we'd like. Uh, I want to rotate around the Y axis. So I'm going to click that and put in 360 because I want it to rotate 360 degrees. I want to do that every second and I want this to update every frame. And these should be fine. So let's press play and see what happens. 
there I've got a little spinning coin. And that is just going to spin and spin and spin forever. This is a very simple FSM that just rotates and that's all it does forever. And you can have FSMs that are this easy. Now we want a little bit of excitement here to uh, bring a highlight to it. So I have a little coin sparkle particle effect that I've created. And that comes in at 0, 0, 0, but I'm going to move it up so it's roughly centered with that object. And again, just a, a simple little particle effect that will highlight when we play. The coin will spin, the particles won't. And there we can see. That draws a little bit more attention to the coin itself, so you can see it from across the room or whatever that is. And I can take the coin sparkle prefab and parent it right to the coin. So that's all part of the same object now. And if we move it around, because the parent itself has its orientation here, when we line it up or move it, it's, it's all going to move together, which, again, is what we want. Then we need to make this a pickup so you can run over it and it will disappear assuming that the player has collected it. And that will once again take a trigger. So we'll make simple cube, unity, and I'm going to get rid of the mesh renderer right away so we can see the size of it because I want to scale it down so that it's a little bigger than the cube. Actually, it's sitting all over the place. So let me. First of all, let me just line this back up, zero, zero, zero with the world. And then I'll bring it up. And I'm just gonna eyeball this. It's not that important to get it totally right. And you could definitely make it tighter. Go ahead and bring that in a bit. So you have to really get up on that coin so you can't pick it up from a, across the way. This is totally up to you. Remember, it's invisible. Don't forget to click box trigger, or is trigger on your box collider. Uh, it's an invisible trigger. Whenever you touch it, you're going to pick it up. So it's up to you, and it'll, it'll be different per game where you want it to be placed. That right around there is good. Let's name it T underscore coin. Whoops, sorry. Trigger. That'll work. And I'm also going to parent that to the coin object. So now we have the coin trigger, the coin sparkle effect, and the coin itself all attached to this one object, and they all move around together. Super cool. Now we can get down to adding an FSM to the coin trigger itself, which will allow us to pick up this coin. And we don't need any fancy setup, I think, yet, so let's add a trigger action so we trigger event we want on trigger enter because we're going to run into this to pick it up like physically run over it as a character and add a transition add one more state we will say collected and let's add a custom event of picked up put that right in there wire it together, and finally return to here, choose send event, picked up. And that should get us to this stage where we can get rid of this object. All right, the last thing I'm gonna do real quick is name this listener. Much like a cube, if you don't, if you don't name your things as you go along, you're gonna get towards the end of your project or halfway through and you're gonna have you know, a whole bunch of states all named state one or state five or whatever, and they won't mean anything to you. So, you know, start to set some standards for yourself. I tend to call listener, uh, anything with a trigger in it, I call it a listener. That's just what I do. Uh, that's how I remember it. You can call it anything you want. But if you set up some standards for yourself naming and then otherwise name things really descriptively, you'll be able to look at this stuff as you go along and have it make a lot more sense. Okay, so let's add a destroy action here. Because when you pick this up, you want to destroy it. You want to get it out of the game world. So 
you know, if you pick it up, it should go away. That's an obvious play thing. If you get rid of it, you don't want to just make it invisible because it's still hanging out there, taking up resources, even though it's invisible. You really want to totally destroy this object. So let's type in destroy, and you'll see we have component, object, and self as options. Let's try self and see what this does. Put destroy self on. An option for detached children would mean, like we've been parenting things, this would leave behind its children. Let's just run this and see what happens. So there's our coin. If I run over top of it, we see that it's gone away. If you look down in the, um, in the Playmaker window, the, all that stuff's gone. And if you look in the hierarchy up here, I just pause for a second. If you look here in the hierarchy, the trigger's gone. It's destroyed itself, and there's no FSM anymore because the trigger's gone, but it left the coin behind. So this is not going to work for us because we want to destroy this level. We want to destroy the coin, which would take everything with it. We don't want to just destroy ourself. So to do that, we're going to get rid of this. Whoops, sorry. And remove this action. Go to the action browser, and I want to destroy an object. Not just myself, but an object. And this will allow us to pick some other object. So we need to, from this FSM, uh, get a hold of this coin object so we can tell it to destroy itself. And it's pretty easy to do, really, if you stop and think for a minute. The, the coin trigger is what the FSM is, is attached to. And we want to reach this coin object right above it in the hierarchy. And if you think about it, this is, when we drop this in, we call it parenting. And so this is the parent of this object, uh, the coin trigger. So the child object, T coin trigger, and the parent object, coin. So if we get rid of our destroy object... Remove action, make sure collected is selected, come back to the action browser, and let's type destroy again, and we see we don't have anything like that. So let's look at parent, and aha, we've got a get parent object that we can use. And we don't want to do it here, well we could do it here, let's do it here. Let's do it since we're looking at it, coin parent, or uh, get parent for the coin. Here we've got get parent, and it says, which game object do you want to get? Use owner. It seems a little confusing unless you think about it. We want to get the parent of the current owner. Okay, the owner is T coin trigger. The owner of this FSM is T coin trigger. And we want to get the parent, here it is, of that. So this is exactly what we want right there. By default, it gives you what you need. But the store result is where we need to fill something in because this is going to be the variable that we're going to use. Remember the bucket we're going to stuff the reference to this into. And before we can put anything there, we need to make one. So just like we make events here, we're going to go over to variable. Okay, I'm going to make a new variable, and I'm going to call it parent to destroy, and I want it to be a game object, okay? And we come back to our state, and if you click here and look, oh, not going to show up. Oh, I didn't create it. Parent to destroy. I want it to be a game object, and I'll create it. And I come over here. And now, parent to destroy shows up in that list. So that's how you get access to a brand new variable that you've created right there. And right behind this, now we want to destroy an object. We'll use the same one we did before, but this time, instead of manually dragging something to it, we can switch right here, use variable button, and look. Parent to destroy is right there because it's also looking for a game object. So right here, let's step through this. We get the parent of whatever the FSM is attached to, okay? This FSM is attached to the coin trigger. So we get the parent of T coin trigger, and that would be this coin object. And we take that reference, 
and we stick it here into the parent to destroy variable. Then we go down the stack and we run destroy object and we hand back this value out of this variable. So now destroy object knows exactly what to destroy. And we don't need to delay. Let's run this and see if it actually works. So there's our coin spinning, particles and everything. And if we run over it, it disappears and it's gone. And that is exactly what we wanted. And if you look up here, it's been deleted out of our scene. So exactly what we wanted. Now let's, for fun, <laughs> try a couple of them. One over there. Make a third one over here. If I press play, like we did with the vases, we've got three of them. And I should be able to run over this whole chain. And look, they're all gone. I've picked up all three of them. Let me just stress again, this is really a cool thing that we did with the variable. Because right here in this object, we used the variable to find the specific parent of the trigger that's being picked up at the moment. And when you have several of these objects in the scene, they're each running their own FSM. And it has to know, like this trigger here has to be able to find the object it's associated with and not this one. If you run over this one and this coin disappears, that would be really weird. Or if you run over this one and they both disappear, that would also be really weird and really lame too, let's just be honest. So. You need to encapsulate things and hand around specific values using variables. Now let's make a prefab for this. A new prefab right there. I'm going to call this coin. And I will drop that whole mess of stuff right onto the coin object. Delete it. And quick test. There it is. Press play. And our coin object can be completely picked up. The last part that we need to do here is have our vase object, our vase breakable, spawn in uh, the coin on its last stage. So we can have the trigger, the T breakable trigger. Now I'm editing the prefab right here, by the way, which is really super cool. Uh, and I'm looking at the FSM right here. So we've got the exploding part where we uh, create the particle effect, the break puff, then we uh, set the visibility of the broken vase to on. We set the visibility of the uh, not broken vase to off. And let's add right there a create object action, which let's check, make sure, yep, it's right at the bottom of the stack where we want it. And we're going to drag in the coin prefab because it's a prefab, right? It's not something already in a scene, it is a prefab, so it's always going to be available in your game. And the spawn point uh, is another thing where we're gonna have to do one of those things where we get parent, so we know where this needs to go. So let's go back to the setup really quick. And, oh, first make a variable. That's what we gotta do. We want another game object. We're gonna name it coin spawn point and now we can come back to the setup and add a get parent just like we did in the coin store the result as coin spawn point okay easy as that now when we come back here we scroll down the bottom create object this time we can switch and choose the coin spawn point so we're going to create this coin prefab at the location of the parent of this FSM's owning object, which will be, um, well, it'll be this vase breakable when it's placed in the scene. So we'll get the, we'll get the location of the, the entire chunk of stuff here. And everything else should be fine. So let's drop a vase into our scene. Move that over a little bit so it doesn't spawn right when we, or break right when we start the game. And let's test that. So I'll hit play, there's our vase, come in, poof, and there's our coin. So it leaves behind a little coin spinning above the broken thing, and if we come across and pick it up, 
the coin goes away, and we still have the bottom of the broken vase, just like we'd expect. Now, if we do several of those, just double check it here, and move a couple out. Start up, boom, pick up the coin, boom, boom, multiple coins, run across them, pick them all up. Whoop, we missed one. And there you go. You actually have to hit the coin to pick it up. And everything works as, as we'd expected. So we've now built a really simple basic object. You can put this all over your game, reuse it multiple times. And the coolest part is if you want it to behave differently, you can just come in and edit these prefab objects and they will update all over in their game. So to wrap this up, just a couple of quick things. Of course, this little scenario that we've set up could be optimized a lot better for performance. For one thing, right now we have the vase breakable all as uh, one big object that's hiding and showing different parts. So even when it reaches its broken state and all that's left behind is this little chunk, it's actually, it's actually still has the main vase and the particle effect sitting in memory. They're not being rendered, there's no render cost, but they are hanging out in memory doing nothing and eating up a little space. So if you wanted to really optimize like for a mobile platform, you you could set up the vase broken section, kind of like we did the coin, set this up as its own prefab, and then spawn it in and have this vase breakable do what we did with the coin. And after this all gets spawned in and taken care of, have it destroy itself and just go away. Then between that and the coin cleaning itself up, all you would have left truly is this little itty bitty tiny bit of geometry that would take up virtually nothing. And that's pretty cool. Other things you can use this trick for, you know, it's not just for breakable bases and crates and whatnot. This is a multi-stage interactive sort of a setup, and you can use this trick all over the place. If you start watching in games that you play, you're going to see it everywhere. This could easily be a gem in a match three game where you click on it and it spawns its particles or whatever. It could be, say, in an RPG, you could pass by a trailer and then something happens to it, and when you come back by it later, that trailer's on fire, and all kinds of stuff's going on, and then when you pass by it again uh, at some later point in the game, maybe it's just an old burnt-up wreck, you know, and you can, I don't know, loot some old metal scraps off of it or something. It's, it, it's a multi-state object that you can move through with these, different, with these different states, and they don't have to happen as fast as this. They could be hours apart in gameplay. So anytime you've got something that starts out one way, goes through some changes, goes through some changes, and ends up another way, think of applying something like this trick right here. You could have multiple states. All you have to do is, let's say you had a, an object that you had to hit it, say, three times before it broke. You'd have your startup, and you'd have a, a breaking state where it'd play some puffs. And instead of spawning in the broken, it would spawn in a more damaged one and get rid of this one. And then it would leave you at another state that's kind of like kind of like this one where it waits with another waits for another event and then you would have another breaking event which you could play some more particles and change the model again. And so this thing could look more and more dilapidated until you were left with nothing but just this little broken chunk. And you could have that take many many stages. You could have it be as fast and slow as you want it to be. So, you know, no rules here except the ones you put on yourself. Very cool, very creative trick, and it's, uh, it's real bread and butter game design stuff. So don't be afraid to play with it. You can even play it backwards if you wanted to wire this up in another direction. So you started with just a broken piece of junk, and maybe your player's collecting things, and as they come back, the, it gets more and more repaired as they take action. If you want to do more of a restorative game, that's really cool too. So... Any direction, this works just great.